Welcome, everybody. Welcome to all of our Incredibuilders to this first edition of what we're calling Level Up with Incredibuild. Uh, this is a webinar series designed to educate our users with tips, uh, how to's, best practices, use cases, and other helpful content that's going to really empower you um, and other users around the world uh, to become better Incredibuilders. Uh, my name is Jim Schultz. I'm the head of community at Incredibuild. And let me share just something real quick with everyone before we get started. There we go, I should be sharing a um, little deck that I have here. So uh, um, like I said, I'm Jim Schultz. I'm the, the head of community and credit build. And really my job within the company uh, is to build and provide places to, uh, for our, our customers to further improve your skills um, and ultimately build better and uh, software faster. Uh, we recently launched um, an Incredibuild uh, customer forum on Discourse. Uh, we are also preparing to launch our first edition of the Level Up newsletter, so that's going to include more tips and, and use cases and other things. Uh, we're planning to do local events, more web events, workshops, uh, and more. So we would love to hear from all of our customers, though, in regards to what content and formats you think are going to be most helpful to you. I'm going to include my contact info and a link to the forum uh, in the chat, and let me do that real quick here to everybody. There we go. So if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me directly, either through my email um, or, or through the forum. And if we can get you to join the forum, if you haven't joined us over there already, uh, we have a t-shirt that we'd, we'd be happy to give to you. Uh, we have, do have limited supply of these, so make sure that you use this link or you can scan the, the QR code here. Join the forum, uh, introduce yourself there, and then use this form here. And I'll put all this in the chat as well, um, in case you don't have... Uh, not quick enough to grab all this, uh, but go to that link, fill out that form, tell us what your size is, all that stuff. We'll send you one of the one of these T-shirts, and we'd love to talk to you on the forum. This is really a great place for us all to uh, to communicate and keep these conversations going uh, in between these events. A uh, place for you to connect with other other incredible users, uh, get some some tips on best practices and things there as well. Um, so today we are discussing build optimization using Build Monitor. Uh, we're going to break this down into three separate topics. Uh, one, we're going to do a build monitor overview. Then we're going to talk some common scenarios. And then we're going to talk uh, performance optimization using build monitor. And we're going to wrap all this up with some Q&A. Um, uh, so if you have questions, please feel free to, to post them into the chat. Um, you can also post them into the Q&A. Uh, uh, and then uh, we'll give you a chance to come off of mute too and ask your questions that way if you prefer. Uh, joining me today is Yoni Davidson from our customer success team. Some of you may already know Yoni. Um, and Yoni, if you don't mind, for those of you, those of uh, our members who don't know you, if you would just introduce yourself quickly to everybody. Sure. Hi, everybody. So uh, my name is uh, Yoni. I'm uh, with Incredible for about uh, almost uh, 10 years. Uh, started as a customer support. And for some time now, I'm the customer success manager for our uh, largest accounts. Cool. Thank you, Yoni. And thank you very much for prepare, uh, preparing this discussion for our customers here today. Um, like I said, today we are talking about build optimization using Build Monitor within Incredibuild. So perhaps the best place to start is, is going to be to give a short overview of Build Monitor uh, within Incredibuild. I think seeing some of the key menus and options and views is going to help give some context around the rest of this discussion. So Yoni, if you want to uh, go ahead and take control and, and start the overview on Build Monitor. Sure. Thank you, Jim. So, um, well, as you might know, the build monitor is the main source of information and analysis for your builds. So it doesn't matter whether you decide to build uh, C++, run some unit tests, or render graphics, the build monitor will represent your workflow in the exact same way for all build types. So it makes it very convenient uh, to use. When we want to better understand the build monitor, uh, sorry, the build flow and analyze it, we need to be familiar with how the build is represented and what types of info it holds. So we have the agent list. You can find the entire agent list that participate in the build. The first agent in the list is always the initiator. The rest are the helpers. We have the graph area, which holds perhaps the most important key for build analysis and optimization. It holds info about the initiator machine, such as CPU, memory, network, and also regarding the distribution potential at any point of the build. Um, 
we have the task uh, colors. So the task color provides a better understanding of the build flow and acceleration potential. This is why we differentiate them uh, by color. So green, it's a task that can be distributed to remote machine and has no errors. Say compilation task that runs remotely and again, has no uh, errors and no warnings. Hey, Yoni, yeah, can, you know I, can, I, can I, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you really fast? Cause we yeah. do have a question that's uh, in line with all of this. Can you just talk real briefly how, how our users get to this screen uh, to start with? Sure. So what, when, you, when you start a build, in example, from Visual Studio, this screen pops out instead of the regular Visual Studio output by default. So basically you can um, either see it in the Visual Studio itself, you can double click on our tray icon while the build is running and then that screen will pop up. So we have various options to, to, to display that screen. Cool. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but I thought that was important to, to get that point across. No problem. So again, uh, yellow color means that a task that is currently running has a warning. Usually it's something normal, so there is no effect on the build. When the task is, is color in red, it means that there is an error. The build will obviously uh, stop at that point. Double clicking on the red uh, uh, bar will bring you to the relevant uh, point in your code where you, uh, you have the error. Blue color means that the task can run only locally. So note that some tasks will run locally by design, such as link tasks, since due to high IO, there is no benefit of distributing them to remote machines. However, tasks that are not familiar to Incredible, so uh, will also run locally. And in some cases, such tasks can be distributed and or split into several steps that will run in parallel. We will speak about that part later in the in this webinar, so there I will elaborate uh, more about it. Um, we have the build uh, indicator. It will show the build state. So green, it means that the build finished without any warning. Yellow, it means that the build is successful, but it, had, it has warnings. Usually it's perfectly fine. Red means that the build uh, uh, failed due, uh, uh, due to some reason. Again, double clicking on that red bar will forward you to the relevant error message. So this is just a sample in which we can see how powerful the build monitor can be. So in example, we can see a big gap in which in both sides of it, you see only, you can see only those green bars. And uh, during this gap, only blue tasks here are executed. Such behavior is usually made by dependency. It obviously uh, doesn't mean that there is a problem, but since it was so easy to detect, perhaps it will be worthwhile to investigate whether this dependency is actually needed. If it can be removed, obviously you will gain more performance. Another example is uh, the graph area indicators, uh, the ready and the active tasks. So when they are close to each other, I mean the numbers of the ready and active tasks, or let's say equal, like in the sample in the left, it means that in that time frame, the build is fully utilized and there is no further acceleration potential. However, on the right, when uh, we can see that the ready task is higher than the actual active task, this means that by adding more resources, the build can be further optimized. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Jim, <laughs> I jumped a, a slide, so you can take it. Jim, you're in, uh, in mute. Yeah, that helps, huh? <laughs> so yeah, let's let's move on to the common scenarios. That, um, uh, sure. And so some of the things we're going to cover in this will be, you know, how do we see what is causing delays? Uh, when are cores not being fully utilized? And how do we see the issues uh, if the issues are related to network or build configuration and so on? So uh, Yoni, yeah, go ahead and continue. Sure, thank you. So um, let's start with the first scenario that we have, uh, that we can see here. So uh, basically there are no messages, uh, warnings in the messages tab. Uh, this is an important place to look, uh, usually when you want to start investigating something, as you can see, it's grayed out. Uh, it is normal that the remote task will be around 10% longer, but not more than that, not like in the case uh, that you see uh, right here. 
Now, since the remote bar represent the time it takes to the task to reach to the helper machine, plus the calculation time, plus the synchronization time. And since the calculation should be more or less the same as on the initiator machine, it means probably that the problem is with the task send receive time. So let's have a look at our graph area, which can be enabled by double clicking in the graph area itself, which is, uh, which is right here, or by clicking on the view and view system graph uh, menu. So we can see the bandwidth, which shows a stable connection. This is the red line that we see here. However, the connection speed is quite poor, as you can see here. In this specific scenario, it seems that the communication is most likely done uh, using a VPN and the network speed is causing this problem. So in conclusion, the problem here in which the remote tasks are significantly longer than the local one related to a network speed bandwidth so if you increase the bandwidth and the, the performance will probably uh, will be much improved. <clears throat> um, in this scenario, it seems that, uh, uh, that here some helpers simply doesn't participate in the build. So you see those helpers here, but you don't see that they are actually participating uh, during the build. So when such behavior occurs, first, we're going to check the messages tab. In this case, it's enabled and you can see warnings appearing in that screen. Um, so uh, as you can see, there are failed to connect messages which indicate a communication problem. Since the network loses stability, that is indicated by that zigzag that you can see in the graph, we need to check the connectivity between the initiator and the relevant helper. It's port connectivity, not a regular pin. That can be done by installing, for example, a telnet on the initiator and trying to connect to the problematic helper using the port written in the messages tab, which is 31105, as you can see here. So in conclusion, there is a connectivity problem between several helpers and the initiator, once this will be sorted out, you obviously use more compute power and your performance will improve. <clears throat> okay, so in this scenario, we see that builds run only locally, but helpers are seen in the build monitor. Okay, we have a lot of helpers here, but they are not participating in the build. Now, in most cases, a clear message will appear in the messages tab that will indicate the cause for this standalone build scenario. However, in some cases, there will be no clear message, so there is a need to investigate. The reason why the build monitor shows the remote machine but can't use them is because the initiator machine can connect to the coordinator, so it receives the needed helpers. However, it can't connect to them, so it can't distribute any jobs to those remote machines. Um, as can be seen here, the user changed the default port okay, which is usually 31105 to select port automatically. It is possible that the chosen port is blocked and therefore there is no connectivity to the remote agents. So conclusion here, always try to use the recommended ports over the automatic option. However, if you choose to use the automatic option, make sure that you have a proper connectivity between initiator and all your helpers. <clears throat> okay, um, let's uh, uh, speak a little bit about performance optimization, Jim. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to the final topic here. And so Yoni's going to cover some performance related settings and tips you can use that will help you optimize your performance. Um, and if you have questions, yeah, please drop them into the chat or drop them into the Q&A. And uh, uh, we're going to move straight into uh, q and A Q&A session right after this se segment. Great. Okay, so uh, as previously mentioned, the ready and the active task are the most used indicators when it comes to optimizing uh, your build. When you come to a point in which the build looks solid and you already receive a decent build time optimization, and even if you don't think that you reached such optimization, please check the ready and the active task during certain points uh, uh, in your build. So example here, you can see that there is a big difference between the ready and the active task. The acceleration potential is to run 122 tasks in parallel. 
we are currently running only five because we have only five available cores. So adding more uh, cores obviously improve your performance. Note that if from some reason you see that you have a very high amount of ready tasks, you have a, a lot of resources, but the active task seems to also always stuck at maximum of around 150 uh, tasks. Check the coordinator settings as shown in this slide. Okay, since this safety, which limits the amount of course per build may cause such behavior. It usually safe increasing this value to 400. So you, you will have a, a much a better utilization. So feel free to experiment uh, with it. Now, Incredible has two options in order to provide a scale up uh, capabilities. Um, the first one uh, would be something that we call single use VM. Um, it allows you to create a temp helpers, usually on the uh, temp virtual machine. Once created, those helpers will consume a regular incredible license. But when the virtual machine will be terminated, sometimes you need to uh, uh, create and destroy virtual machines, those licenses will be automatically released back to the pool. This allows an on-prem flexibility and scalability without any need to uh, uh, manage the, the licenses manually from the coordinator. The other option is our incredible cloud option. Incredible can automatically create set of virtual machines in your cloud, uh, AWS, Azure, and soon uh, Google Cloud as well, that will act as helper agent in when needed. This virtual machine can be moved into sleep, standby state after their creation. They can be on, it depends on you. Uh, and they're placed in an incredible pool on the cloud. So when incredible coordinator sends a request for available course, the virtual machines in the pool are activated according to the number of requested cores. This mechanism, uh, mechanism significantly decreases the amount of time that is needed for providing available cores for task execution in comparing to launching new virtual machine from scratch each time a request is made. Furthermore, by keeping the VMs in sleep state instead of running uh, in a running mode, your cloud costs are reduced dramatically. Um, you can, again, uh, use spot instances as well uh, in order to do that. Um, Incredible Cloud enables you to define the numbers of virtual machines that will be in, um, included in the pool if uh, that need arises and the acceleration of your task requires more core than the one that you have available in the pool, Incredible Cloud will launch uh, additional uh, VM for you and will terminate them upon the compilation of the task execution. This cloud bursting mechanism works on your cloud account and will only use it if there will be no local resources for the build. Um, so basically when you start a build on-prem, only when you exhaust all your local resources, then Incredible will burst uh, into cloud. Note that Incredible Cloud can be uh, also installed purely on the cloud as well. And it can use, as mentioned before, spot instances in order to uh, reduce your costs. One of the most significant features that Incredible has is the predictive, predictive execution. So in general, this feature allows part of dependent projects to run in parallel, and by that converts the build flow to be much more parallel. This build order uh, is, uh, sorry, the build order is kept since Incredible knows uh, uh, what part can run in parallel in those projects and what part can't, such as links. Um, as you can see above, the top build monitor here Okay, was executed without the predicted execution. So you see a lot of serial uh, execution here. Okay, and on the bottom, you see a build monitor uh, shown uh, with the predictive execution enabled. So even in a standalone build without any helper, that specific build was reduced from 16 minutes to 11 minutes. On top of the above, predictive execution can also run custom steps like uh, mock task and others uh, as well. Now there are a few uh, uh, limitations for the predictive execution that you have to pay attention to. So predictive execution can work, cannot work together with build regardless of error feature that Incredible has. This feature is available only for C++ builds at the moment. 
um, if you have a certain custom step that uh, uh, is running as part of your build, predictive execution will temporarily stop from being activated because Incredible is not aware of what's going on inside your custom step. So for example, if the custom step will or needs to create certain files that are needed for the compilation, we don't want to risk it. We just temporarily stop the predictive execution. Once we are over that step, the predictive execution keeps working. If those custom steps are safe, meaning they are not generating anything important for the build or that affects the compilation, we can mark those custom steps as safe and then you will uh, uh, get also this extra acceleration during the custom step execution. <clears throat> so in this scenario, what we see is a long preparing build, uh, build uh, task step. Um, it, it's very long comparing to the overall build time. Now this usually can happen with C sharp builds, but it can also occur with C++ builds. The reason for that is that Incredible start the build by calling the event, which then call MS build and MS build uh, performs uh, the build. Devon might cause this delay since it will load all the projects prior to the build. And in some cases it is negatively affecting the time that take the build to start. One of the solution is to instruct Incredible to start the build directly using MS build. This can be done by adding a certain switch, the slash use uh, MS build to your uh, build command if you're running from the command line uh, or by changing the relevant setting. Another option is to use the incredible internal mode that is available in the Visual Studio starting from uh, Visual Studio 2017. Uh, and um, then when you start the build, the build uh, will, be start, uh, will, be start, uh, will be started sorry, using uh, MS build. The downside of that method is when you use the internal mode, the predictive execution will be disabled for the entire build. Okay, so this is a, an interesting uh, scenario uh, in which we can definitely gain a, a lot of performance uh, uh, boost. So we see here a limited distribution despite many ready tasks, as you can see above, you have around 600 uh, ready tasks, 27 um, active. Um, the build monitor will usually uh, look like this. You will, you will have all the local cores um, participating in the build and only some, apart, some uh, uh, amount of remote cores. Usually you will see around 12 cores participating. You will see more helpers in the build monitor as you can see here, but they are not participating. So the reason for such behavior is um, basically uh, uh, a certain safety feature that prevents incredible from generating many PDB files on remote machines. So unlike Visual Studio, Incredible has to create PDB file per core and um, high amount of PDB file may cause an out of memory error in MS build component, uh, uh, the MS PDB SRV during the PDB merge. Now, in order to be on the safe side, the default limit is 12 remote core per project. However, in most cases, it is safe to increase this value to 36 and even much, much higher in order to benefit from a, a better distribution and core utilization. In order to find the magic number, there is a need to perform some trial and error um, and find the optimal value. Note that too high value may damage the build performance. So it's not necessarily true that a very high value will improve the performance. <clears throat> now, another, another possible reason for limited remote core usage is a certain setting that some users simply forget to uncheck. In the agent setting, you have a setting that called the CPU allocation. It controls the, the number of remote cores that will be used for that specific initiator. So basically you limit the amount of, of uh, remote resources for a specific, specific initiator. By default, this setting is unchecked, meaning no limit. You can use whatever helpers uh, you want. However, 
Sometimes users don't fully understand this feature and buy or this setting and by specifying a number, they can actually limit the distribution. So whether they understand it or not, in a lot of cases, they simply forget that they change this number. And then at some point they see that they have a, a limited distribution. And, uh, and this is basically the case. <clears throat> okay, so incredible will always intercept the main process in order to distribute the child processes to remote machines. It is possible that further processes leading to the compiler or other intensive compute tasks will be intercepted. Those processes or tasks will be colored in blue since incredible doesn't know how to handle them. Therefore, a long blue bar that you can see in your build monitor can be actually broken to many individual tasks that can run in part. Those definitions are set in a special file called the profile XML that you can configure and add as part of your build command. So please note that in order to benefit from the profile XML and the ability to break certain long tasks into shorter one and distribute, it, distribute them, there is a need of having the DevTool uh, package and it is highly recommended to consult our support team so they will assist you, uh, you know, configuring this file and in this general process. <clears throat> now, since a link is a single task that uses a lot of uh, input, uh, a lot of IO, the link task is not distributed and therefore colored in blue. There is a little, there is little that Incredible can do in order to further accelerate a link task besides running the link in parallel on local machine. You can see here, you can actually define how many links you allow to run uh, in parallel. Um, sometimes, in some cases, it is not recommended to use all local cores to run the links. Links can be a very heavy tasks. So it is sometimes recommended to try and, and use only like 80% of your local cores, see if it actually benefit with the overall performance. If not, use the default, which is always to, to try and use all the, the local cores. Um, another, uh, some other advices are, uh, is that you don't use the PDB option and use the old PDB method, which is the slash Z7. Um, other linking options that can reduce the link time is to avoid using the, the LTCG and the GL switches, using the incremental switch and using the fast link option when using uh, the PDB files. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Uh, that. Yoni, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for that overview. Uh, we do have a few questions in the sure. chat and, and two of them I think were probably related. Um, uh, and these are related to actually just getting to these screens. So we have somebody who's using uh, Team City command line, uh, accessing from Chrome on Linux, and then someone else um, uh, isn't seeing this either on, on Linux or Windows using Chrome or Edge. Um, uh, this one says in the build history, he sees a play button, but when he clicks it, I see stuff moving in textual view, uh, but the graphical view is blank. So. Can we cover that a little bit just on how to actually get get to this uh, to these screens to help some of these people get to the, the build monitor? Sure. Uh, look, we are, uh, uh, this session covers the, the Windows uh, support. So basically what I'm showing here is under Windows. Under Windows, in order to, to get to the build monitor itself, basically you need to run a certain build, either on Visual Studio or from the command line. Now, when you run a build, um, if you run it from Visual Studio, as I mentioned before, the build monitor will pop automatically in your Visual Studio output area. If it doesn't, you can simply go to the tray icon, right click it. You can open the build monitor from there. You can double click the tray icon. It will also open the currently running build monitor or the one that previously ran. So there are a couple of options. None of them are from browsers. It's not a web, uh, um, we don't have a web GUI uh, in the Windows product. So everything is done, uh, you know, from your machine, 
from the tray icon from the uh, from Visual Studio if you're using Visual Studio. So those are basically your options. Very cool. And then uh, uh, thank you. Maybe we can put some of those instructions in the the video description we post this so people yeah. can get started on that before they actually uh, start watching. Um, another one is about working from home. So is there a minimum recommended up and down speed uh, to work remotely with Incredibuild? Yeah, so so usually the problem when working from home is the upload speed. The upload speed is uh, uh, somehow limited in a lot of places. In order to work in a decent manner with Incredible, we usually recommend uh, 50 megabits per second upload speed um, around, let's say, between 100, 200 minimum download speed. That should do the trick. In some cases, I saw that uh, we, we did have a decent acceleration even with 20 megabit uh, um, upload speed. But again, it's very specific to your scenario. For example, if you're building uh, uh, regular code, you don't have any heavy or big input file such as precompiled headers. I think even uh, uh, around 20, between 20 and 50 megabits of upload speed will be uh, enough to receive a, a decent acceleration. Okay, and then the last question I have in the chat, and by the way, if, if you have a question that you'd like to um, uh, uh, say, uh, we can take you off of mute, just raise your hand and then I can, I can take you off of mute um, after this question. But, uh, or you can just put them into the chat or the Q&A. Um, but this is about debugging. So it, it, do you have, is there a best way or a recommended way to debug errors within Incredibuild? I know that's a um, pretty broad question, but. Again, if you're speaking about debugging problem in your code, basically we do have a debug option. Uh, if you go to Visual Studio, open Incredible menu, you will have the debug option, the same as you have if you don't have Incredible and you use the regular build menu in Visual Studio. So you can choose whether you want to debug using Visual Studio, and then the, you, will, you, know, you will go all the way uh, to the area in which you want to debug, or you can use Incredible and you just get to that point probably faster because the compilation process is faster but those options are equivalent <clears throat> thank you very much thanks for the question raj uh if there are any other questions i'm going to just keep this open for another few minutes to look you can either type them in or like i said you can click the raise hand button and then i can take you off the mute as well so you can ask that way but we'd like to keep this, this going on a monthly basis. Again, if, if you have uh, ideas of things you'd like us to cover in these sessions, please let us know. Um, we're happy to design one of these, these uh, webinars around that. We want this to be you know, really designed for our customers and our users um, to make sure that you guys are getting the, the content that you want from these things. All right, there's another question in here. What's the relationship between active tasks and utilized CPUs? I usually see these being almost the same. I think one of your screenshots showed them significantly diverged. Again, it uh, it's really depends. Um, the CPU is will spike with or without incredible. It will be in some cases close to 100% because you're building code on your machine, so your machine works very hard. So it really depends what kind of tasks are currently running. You can run certain tasks that, and the CPU will not be high. You can run few tasks and the CPU will spike. Basically, high CPU, low amount of tasks, or high CPU, a lot of uh, amount of tasks is pretty normal. What's usually, let's say, can be stressful is that you have a very, very long period of CPU that is going around 100%, that can affect a little bit on the time that it will take the initiator to synchronize the task from remote machine because it's overloaded with the task that it currently has to perform. And on top of that, it has to synchronize also the remote machines. If this is the case, we have a lot of settings that will allow you to reduce the load from the local machine. So you basically can instruct Incredible to use only part of your cores, and then the CPU usage will drop. You can even instruct Incredible to distribute as much as it can or reduce the load as much as it can from the uh, local machine to the remote machine. And then the CPU will be much, much 
uh, lower, this will actually allow the developer to continue working regularly on his machine on other projects because there will be no significant load on the local machine. Well, the next question here um, about a white box or not colored uh, in build monitor. Uh, what does that mean? And is this something to worry about? If there is, a, you mean the gap, the gap that that we saw in the in one of the slides, or just a white bar? Uh, no, it's actually a, a white box. A white box. Okay, so white box usually represent a recovery. So we have se uh, several mechanism in which, for example, um, you have two tasks that are uh, sorry. You have a, a certain task that runs on a remote machine. Um, when the initiator is not very busy, it will try to run the same task in parallel. Why? Because the initiator machine usually faster. So it, it's some sort of a competition. So the first task that finished wins and the other one is canceled. So when a certain task is canceled, then it colored in white. Other, um, other scenario is uh, there, perhaps there was a problem and there was an automatic recovery. So incredible doesn't always fail the build. If there is a problem, we try to recover the task. Now recovery can be, for example, if there was some uh, problem with the remote machine, network problem, you know, power failure, whatever, then the task will be colored in white. It means that they were canceled and those tasks will go to a different machine and run there. If there are a lot of white boxes, a lot of bars, then this is something that we need to investigate because we need to, to better understand what's causing those, uh, those uh, tasks to be white. Well, thank you for the questions. This is awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, we, we have another one here. We have a very complex solution with many C++ and C Sharp projects. Sometimes after changing a single C++ file, Incredibuild builds many projects that shouldn't depend on the changed file. How do we find the reason for this? Well, so um, again, this is something that uh, it would be better to consult with us. We need to analyze the build monitor, not in the way that I showed you. Build monitor is basically a very comprehensive log uh, that shows exactly what's going on inside your build. So again, if the, the, this is a, something that you experience when you change one file and a lot of files that usually don't need to build are being built, we need to look into it. Do note that sometimes when you change a certain file, it doesn't mean that only that file should be built because you have dependencies. So even if you change one file, it can cause other projects to be built. So if this behavior doesn't happen without Incredible and it happens only with Incredible, obviously this is something that, uh, that we have to look into it. But if it happens also without Incredible, then it is normal. Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Michael. Any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. I don't see any more in the chat. We'll give another minute here in case somebody's typing frantically here. Yoni, thank you very much too. This is a great yeah, overview yeah. And, and thank you for uh, <laughs> being open to answering all these questions on the fly here. All right, I don't see any more in here. Uh, again, this this was recorded, so we're going to do some quick edit on this, and then we'll have this available for everybody. We're going to drop it into the forum, so make sure that you join the forum, which is at community.incredibuild.com. Um, and uh, uh, our next one, we're going to do another one, I think, next month, and we're going to cover getting to know your coordinator mm -hmm. setting. Um, so again, if, if anyone has any additional suggestions of other things you'd like us to cover in these sessions. Uh, we want this to be designed for you, for our users. So definitely let us know. Uh, uh, thank you. There, yeah. there is another interesting uh, question, not question, but a request perhaps from uh, Michael that he wants to hear more about that XML file for custom parallelization. In, ah. Okay. So yeah, we will be, um, again, we can, uh, if you can, you can write us to our support or we can just leave your email and we will happy to, to connect with you and explain more. It's a bit difficult to explain it here because you need to 
you know, we need to show you uh, how it looks like. We need to show you the structure. It's actually very, very easy. Um, we will be happy to send you a link even to the uh, user manual in which you will see all the instructions, how to configure that, uh, that file. Again, just um, if you want, we will approach you. I, I guess we have your email, so um, cool. we will be happy to explain. Will this be a good topic to Yoni to do in a, in a future talk? Um, I don't know. I have to look into it. Uh, it it's, can be a bit short, so we might integrate it to some other, you know, into another topic. So combine gotcha. it together, I mean. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for that, that uh, request as well. All right. And thank you again, uh, Yoni, for covering all this with everybody and for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you to all of our incredible builders who tuned in with us live. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions uh, live, definitely uh, uh, join us next time for the, uh, for the live event. And if uh, um, you're watching this uh, uh, on YouTube and, and in the forum, you can leave your questions in the forum as well and we'll answer those there. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Yoni, have a good night. I know it's late for you, you and everyone else. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you later.